Hey everybody, welcome back to the Retro Hack Shack. I'm Aaron Newcomb. On this video, I'm going to be completing my series uh, of converting RGB video into HDMI. Parts one and two are already available on my channel. Part one is where I built a board that connects to a Raspberry Pi to give HDMI output. And part two is where I tested that on my 5150 using CGA and EGA graphics to an HDMI monitor. However, it turns out that this board also has a third component you can build, which is an analog board. So that will take simple signals in, uh, for example, from a color computer or from an Apple II, and then pass them through so that you can get HDMI output from those as well. So this will be part three of that series, but I think I'm gonna try to hook this up to my color computer model one. Now I did a video on the Color Computer Model 1 trying to add uh, composite output and also fixing it up and doing some repair and uh, refurbishing. And that video is available as well, but I kind of gave up in the process. I couldn't get really good quality composite out. Well, now I'm gonna see if I can take this board, hook it up to the Color Computer 3, or Color Computer 1, and get HDMI output uh, to a big screen. And I think if I can do that, I will have finally solved that problem as well. So depending on how you look at it, this is part three of the RGB to HDMI series, or it's part two to the Color Computer One Repair series. So either way, it's always satisfying to kill two birds with one stone. That's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Okay, so before we get into testing, I wanted to explain what I've learned about how this works. And just to revisit where we left off uh, from last time when I put together that HDMI board that connected to my 5150, um, we essentially had two boards there. We had the Raspberry Pi. This is just a stock Raspberry Pi Zero. So nothing, uh, nothing too interesting there. But then we made this other board, which converts the analog, or excuse me, the uh, digital RGB signals that come out of, uh, let's say, a CGA signal or an EGA signal, or even a monochrome uh, digital signal out of the back of a computer. And we it takes those and converts those uh, through the use of this CPLD to be able to use the output of the Raspberry Pi. It uses the HDMI output and outputs an HDMI signal. And because we're using the Raspberry Pi, it gave us a lot of configuration options so that we could choose, for example, between one type of system and another where there might be some slight variances. Um, so what this project does then is tries to figure out, okay, that's fine for digital RGB signals, but what do you do when you have an analog signal? Now that might be something like a uh, the, uh, uh, composite output, for example, from an Apple II or a composite signal basically from, from any other system, like the, there's a uh, YUV signal that is generated inside the Tandy color computer. So how do you take that type of signal, an analog signal, and get it through the HDMI output on the Raspberry Pi? Well, the way that we do that, or the way that this project has chosen to do that, is with yet another board. So this board, um, if, if you look at the way this is constructed, this board actually s gets sandwiched in between these other boards. So um, if you look at the, the board that I built last time, this is it here. Uh, we've got the Raspberry Pi down here and we've got the, uh, the board that I built that does the conversion of the digital RGB to the HDMI output here. And you can see there's two boards and you know, this is called a hat in uh, Raspberry Pi land. Um, but this just sits on top and then the cable comes out in between. And so what they did was they said, okay, well, that's great. So let's take the, uh, take what we had, this sandwich board, but we'll add another board in between and that gets sandwiched. Let's see if I can get this in there. It has to go in some pins. There we go. So now we add this other board in between these two. And what we end up with is really a nice little analog to digital sandwich. So now what we're doing is we're adding another layer 
that takes in an analog signal, converts it to digital RGB, outputs that to this board, and then that takes that signal and converts it to HDMI. So it'll be interesting to see if the conversion, all those different steps of conversion will actually work in order to prevent any lag in the, uh, in the final product when we actually get our signal out to HDMI. It'll be interesting to see if there's any lag because that's quite a, bit, quite a few conversion bits that are happening here. So let's take a look at this new board and see what's different about it or what kind of components it uses. And um, I have already soldered this together. If you wanna take a look at some of my SMD soldering techniques, you can go back to the first part of this three-part series, which is either linked up above or down below and or down below in the description um, and take a look at those. I wasn't gonna bore you with all the soldering. Uh, needless to say, this board went together okay using my digital microscope that I built and uh, I was able to get all the components soldered on. In fact, the only problem I had was when I put on this voltage regulator uh, backwards because I didn't quite see the markings that were on the board, but that was pretty easy to fix. I just took some solder wick and was able to remove the regulator and put it over in the right place and then solder everything else in, no problem. But let's just take a look at the major components first and then take a look at how this is actually going to work because I found it to be quite fascinating the way all these different components play together to make this work. Especially given the fact that this has is size limited essentially, right? I'm sure one of the design goals for this was to keep it smaller than uh, the Raspberry Pi itself and it had to fit in that sandwich like we saw before. So they did a really good job of kind of squeezing everything on the board and still being able to allow people like me to do hand soldering to assemble one of these. So kudos to the uh, the uh, uh, the person or team that put this together because it really wasn't as bad as it looks to put together. So let's take a closer look at the various components on this particular board. So if you see down here, this uh, smaller chip with the very narrow pin pitch here, which was kind of difficult and uh, a bit nerve wracking for me because I only ordered one of these by mistake, um, but it came out okay. Anyway, this chip here is a Max 529 8-bit octal DAC. Now that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook if you're not into electronics, but what it means is this is a DAC or a digital to analog converter chip. And what that does, the fact that it's 8-bit, that just is, the, is a measure of the resolution. And the fact that it's octal means that there are eight output uh, pins here. And what it does is it converts a digital signal to analog. And, and uh, this can be used to uh, put out, for example, let's say you want a, uh, the Raspberry Pi could talk to this particular chip and say, hey, on this particular pin, I want to see an analog voltage of 1.2 volts. Great. Done. Right. So that's how that works. So that's pretty neat. Uh, these two chips up here are actually quad TTL comparators. And uh, if you don't know what a comparator is, it's similar to an op amp or it actually uses an op amp, uh, but it does what it sounds. It's a comparator. So it compares two different voltages and it can tell you basically, essentially in this case, I believe it's just sensing whether you have a high signal or a low signal based on some reference value. So that's what those two chips do. And then I believe this chip down here is the uh, 74LVC4066 quad bilateral switch. Again, if I would have heard these things like a couple years ago, if you were to tell me that's what that was, I would have said, who cares? I don't know what that means. You're crazy. Get out of here. You're speaking a foreign language. Um, but essentially what this is, is it's just a switch. So if you can imagine a relay, I don't know if I have any relays here. Do I have any? Yeah, I do. So it's essentially the same as one of these relay boards um, here. That little that little switch there is essentially the same as this uh, relays, which you may have used for some Arduino projects if you're turning lights on or off or something like that. It's very similar to this board here in that you connect, let's say, a positive voltage and uh, you can put a signal in here and that turns this relay switch on, the light comes on, and if you turn off the signal, it turns the relay off and your light goes off. Very, very similar to this type of functionality, but it's all baked into this little tiny chip. And of course it can't handle the types of voltages that that other board can. But um, this particular chip serves that same function. It's essentially a switch. So that's essentially it for the board. I know it looks very crowded and there are a lot of resistors and capacitors. There's another little switch here, that little one. And then there's a 
a, a, a voltage regulator here, a 3 volt, 3.3 volt voltage regulator. But that's it. There's some room for expansion on the back. You can put another one of those comparators here. There's a place for that if you want to, for certain systems, if you want to connect to those. But uh, other than that, that's it. So let's take a look real quick at the schematic and see if we can figure out exactly how this thing is working. And then we will try to program it. Okay, so just FYI, I'm trying out OBS, OBS Studio, which is uh, some software for combining uh, different video sources uh, to hopefully make my videos look a little bit better. So let me know what you think. Uh, I've also flipped the the uh, little picture in picture around so that hopefully when I'm looking at something over here, it's actually looking the right way on the camera at, at, on the video as opposed to looking reversed or mirrored. So uh, let me know what you think about this. Let me know if it's any clearer. Anyway, so I wanted to take a look at the schematic to see exactly how this thing works. And believe me, I am no expert in schematic design, <laughs> uh, PCB design, electronics. I'm just here learning and sharing with you what I learn. Um, so if I get a few things wrong, let me know in the comments, of course, but uh, uh, I don't claim to be an expert in this stuff. So uh, taking a look at the schematic, there are uh, a number of things to point out. First of all, if you're not used to reading schematic, a couple of things that are going to be important as you follow along here. One is uh, obviously the uh, the the green lines are physical connections between one pin and another pin, for example. The uh, representation here is not always uh, exactly like it is in the physical world. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> we talked about these uh, chips over here, these uh, U1 and U2. Let's see if I can highlight those. Uh, here we go, U1 and U2. I'm using some drawing software as well, so this is the first time. I think if I do that, now I can draw a box. Look at that. Here's U1 and U2, for example. Let's just highlight U1. So here's U1, the U1 chip on the board. And when you look over here, there's you know a lot of components. But if you look carefully uh, up here, you can see U2, A, B, C, D. I remember I said these are quad port chips, so they have four connections. And uh, you can see here, this, the, this set of components right here actually represents this chip over here. So uh, all that to say that in a schematic, things can be virtual. They don't have to have like one big box around it to represent a component, and that's the case here. So we have uh, U1 is represented by these four op amps. That's the symbol for an op amp. And then there's also U2 up here. That's another chip. And then I, I mentioned that there's a uh, optional U7, which is a third comparator chip, and that's represented right there. Um, so think of these, as you look at the schematic, think of these as... Um, uh, one component, even though they've split them out virtually here. The last thing, whoops, still getting used to the software. The last thing that I will say is the, um, if you're not used to reading schematics, you can label something on your schematic with what's called a net label. And you can actually see that right here. This wire doesn't go to any, any, uh, other um, component here on the board. It's just labeled as A blue, right? And you'll also see over here that there are some labels and you'll see over here that there are some labels. So uh, this is something that you need to watch out for as you're dealing with schematics. Maybe uh, early on, it's something that I certainly learned as I was dealing with schematics is what these net labels are. And so you just have to think if something has a net label of A blue, then anything it's connected to anything else that has a net label of A blue. So this pin three here, even though it goes off to some other other components, it's also connected to this uh, chip, this part of the chip right here. So something to keep in mind. There we go. I erased that pretty good that time. Um, so let's just take a look at what's going on. These connections, let's see, let's start with the, the analog input. So that would be these connect, this connector up here is uh, corresponds to this physical connector over here. So these are where the analog signals are coming into the board. Um, and from there, you can see that via these net labels, they're getting connected to these comparators. And again, these comparators are just looking at the voltage levels and trying to figure out if the voltage level is high or low or what that voltage level is. 
Um, and so it's it's basically just looking to see what is the uh, state of that particular signal that's coming in on that wire. Um, and then what we have down here is we have a this max 5259 DAC, a digital to analog converter. And you can see that that's connected to these pins here. So here's our um, DAC on the board. And here are those pins that it's connected to. I know physically it looks like they're close on the schematic and they're further away on the board. That's just how you have to connect things sometimes. Um, they're connected this way so that they can connect to the uh, the RGB to HDMI board that we made earlier. And the reason that's important is because, number one, this chip needs a clock signal and it has a data line, for example, uh, um, and a chip select line. And that allows the... Um, I'm not sure if this instructions are coming from the Raspberry Pi itself. I think they might be. Um, or if it's coming from the um, CPLD on the other board. But anyway, it allows you to, in the preferences, talk to this chip. And that's be important because uh, what this chip is doing is setting a reference value. And you can see those, those uh, net labels here for those reference values. These reference values are what enable you to uh, hook this up to more than one uh, computer um, so that you can change things programmatically uh, because what these reference values do is they set the reference for the comparator. So for example, if you had a chip um, uh, in a computer, like in a Tandy, for example, uh, Tandy uh, color computer has a certain chip. Let's see if I can find the name of it. It is the, uh, uh, the Motorola 6847. So if you had a Tandy 1000 that had that chip, the video levels that that's going to be putting out are going to be at a certain voltage level, typically. Um, and you need to be able to set these reference values because in this case, that voltage level might be 1.3 volts that you need to be at, or maybe half of that so that you can be in between. I don't remember what the voltage levels are for that one. But then if you move over to another system, say an Apple II or uh, an Atom, then those voltage levels might be higher or lower depending on what that particular video chip puts out. And so you need to be able to set these reference levels. And if you want to programmatically change what computer you're connecting to at any one given point in time, also keep in mind that this is old equipment with variances in those chips. There may be different uh, chips that came out on different models of computers, even though it's the same uh, the same model chip, it might be a, a different revision of that chip that may have slightly different uh, uh, voltage levels for those signals that are coming out of that chip. And so being able to adjust on the fly what these reference values are allows you to connect to a lot of different computers and different, uh, even if it's the same model, different versions of that model. What I'm saying is these references are very important to have this in there. Otherwise, you'd only be able to connect one of these boards to one computer at a time because these reference values would be hard programmed. So that's essentially how this works. The signals come in through the um, the analog connections over here, and then they are compared. And then you can see these uh, references here coming out of the comparator correspond to the uh, TTL connections that we saw earlier, which are going to go into the RGB to HDMI board that we built last time. And then those are going to get processed to HDMI. So several stages. First, analog comes in, gets converted to a digital signal based on these comparators and how they're working. That gets output as digital RGB to the RGB board. That gets sent to the Pi uh, as HDMI for the HDMI output. Essentially, that's how it works. Now, I did ask one of the uh, creators of um, uh, this project, Ian B is his name in the forums. Um, but one thing he says is, and I hope I got this explanation right, uh, he says that this approach and doing it this way with the adjustable voltages, the comparators, etc., cetera, uh, results in a completely noise-free output as the signal has effectively been requantized re to just a few levels. And it works extremely well when there's enough difference between the voltage levels of the video source, but it won't work at all if the voltage levels are too close together, so they can't be reliably separated due to noise. So what he means there is if you have a particularly fast video signal where this setup can't distinguish between the voltage levels that are coming in from the video signal, it's not going to work. And I think that's why this particular board only works with certain 
models of computers. The, definitely the older ones are, are going to be uh, easier to to decompose this analog signal and transpose it into a digital signal. So uh, there's been a lot of comments on the forum about, well, can we use this for um, you know Sega Genesis or a Super Nintendo system or one of those that puts out analog, but uh, um, an analog signal, can we use that to get HDMI? And I think up till now, the answer has been no, because um, the components and the speed of the Pi just aren't fast enough to distinguish between those signals. And by the way, I mentioned during, uh, I believe it was the first part of this series where I was talking about the different options, I mentioned that I would be probably buying a retro tank. And I said I would explain why, and I realized I never did. The reason why I will most likely be buying a retro tank is just that. I can't build necessarily a board like this uh, using a Raspberry Pi to get some of those composite signals uh, um, deconstructed. And the retro tank does a pretty good job at doing this. It has some quirks, but it does a good job. And I believe it uses an FPGA to do this, which is going to be faster, more options to program than the CPLD. And so I will most likely be buying a retro tank just for this version or just for that reason. Okay. With that said, let's go ahead and see if we can get the software loaded onto the device and then we can do a test. So I realized in part one, when I went over the installation of the software to the Raspberry Pi for this particular board that I kind of went over it kind of quickly. So I just thought I'd take an extra minute to go over the software installation for those that maybe haven't done it before. Uh, the first thing you're going to need is a micro SD card to put in the Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have to be a big one. I think I'm using a 16 gig version, but I think, you know, eight gig is, is fine. If I just can't find those anymore, it seems like the smallest ones that I can find for a reasonable price are about 16 gigs. So, uh, but this doesn't take up much space. The second thing you're going to want to do is go to this website that I have up on the screen. This is the GitHub page for the project. Um, and I'll try to put another link to this down below in the description of this video as well. If you haven't downloaded code from a GitHub page before, you may be tempted to click on this green code button, but that's for actually downloading the source code. What you want to do is go over to the releases section, which is over here on the right. And what you'll find is there's two things in here. It lists the latest stable release, which was published uh, back in May on May 4th of 2020. In this case, as I'm doing this recording, however, I've found that the, um, uh, the latest releases, uh, the build, re the latest builds are actually very stable in and of themselves. So what I do in instead of clicking on this link, which just goes to the the latest stable release, I just click on the releases, all the releases, and you can get the latest build. So here's it's uh, categorized as pre-release um, as opposed to latest stable release but I'm going to download the latest. And this one you can see was uh, this latest build was done on 11, uh, sorry, November 26th of 2020. So quite a bit later, and they've added quite a few fixes to profiles. You can see if you're curious for these releases, if you, you want to see what changed, you can actually see a description of what's changed uh, from build to build, which is kind of maybe interesting for people to see. So I'm going to download this latest release. And if you go down here to assets, you can see there's a zip file. So I'm just going to click on that. It's going to ask me where I want to download it. And I'm just going to download it in this case, just to keep things clean. I'm going to download it directly to the SD card. You don't have to do this. You can put this anywhere on your computer, but I'm just going to put it there for now to keep things nice and clean as we go through this. And that's downloaded. Now I'm going to open up that zip file and extract that to my micro SD card. So here's what's in that zip file. You can take a look. There's some, uh, you can see here's the CPLD firmware that will get uploaded to your CPLD when you uh, boot up the Pi for the first time. Here's uh, the different versions of the kernel that are, uh, I believe these come directly from Raspberry Pi Foundation. And there's you know some custom config data, et cetera, in here. But this is basically all there is to it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to extract all of this information uh, instead of putting it in a folder on my micro SD card, I'm just going to put it in the root folder. The I drive is this particular card that I inserted. So I'll hit extract and it'll just take a minute. And now we can see just the files that would, that are necessary to be put on the, uh, 
micro SD card. And if we take a look at the size of this particular drive, uh, you can see that we've only used 32 megabytes of space on this 16 gigabyte card. And it is formatted as FAT32. Okay, now I've ejected my SD card from my Windows system. It's important to use that eject feature to make sure all your uh, files are finished writing to the SD card before you remove it. Uh, I've ejected it, removed it, and put it in my Raspberry Pi, and I'm ready to power this up for the first time. So that's what you're seeing here is a blank screen. Again, if I got something wrong on my soldering, this isn't going to work. Hopefully I got everything correct. Uh, but if you have everything correct, you don't have any shorts on your board, or maybe you purchased a board from somebody, you assume that all of the everything's uh, soldered correctly, should just be able to power this up. Uh, with the SD card installed, and we should get a message on the screen when we do that. Okay, so that's good. That's the ras typical thing that you would see from the Raspberry Pi when it first starts booting up. There we go. Perfect. So we're into the menu now, and this is the menu you get when you boot it up for the first time. And it's asking you, it's saying that the CPLD is unprogrammed because you haven't done anything with it yet. And luckily, like I said in the other video, this programs the CPLD for you, which is fantastic. So I'm going to, I built a six bit board and you can see the options here are the three bit or the, or the six to 12 bit because there's a six bit an eight bit and a 12 bit version. Anyway, I've got the six bit board. So I'm gonna go down to the, using the buttons on the device that we just built. I'm going to go down and uh, select that version of firmware for the CPLD and hit the uh, OK button. It says it's currently blank. Do you want to write that firmware? I'm going to say, yes, I do. It's erasing, it's programming, and it should be done in just a second. Verifying, and now it's successful, and it's about to reboot. Okay, there we go. So now it's come up, it's rebooted and it's come up and it says there's no sync detected because there's no signal coming into the board. Uh, however, we can go ahead and open up the menus, I believe, there we go. And then we can go down and start to configure this if we wanted to do it, or we can wait until we have our source connected, our source video to um, uh, configure this the way that we want. So that's it, that's how easy it is to get the software on this board once you've got your board built. All right, so here we are with uh, the system that I am going to try to modify to get HDMI out, and that is my TRS-80 Color Computer Model 1, which uh, if you haven't done it already, I recommend that you click up above and actually take a look at the, uh, the video I did previously where I tried several composite mods for the TRS-80 Color Computer Model 1, and none of them really came out to any degree of satisfaction. They all kind of worked, but the quality just wasn't there. And at the end of the day, I just gave up. If you remember, um, this was the end of the previous video. Um, so at the end of the day, I am gonna take this out, which is kind of sad because I think this project became more about, can I do it more than uh, do I need to do it? And at the end of the day, I wasn't able to complete the composite mod. Now, there were some other things I did. I cleaned up the keyboard. Uh, unfortunately, I ruined the finish here uh, at the top of the uh, uh, color computer. Um, it was a good learning experience, very popular video, so I would highly recommend that you watch it. So now this is becoming part two of that video as well as part three of the other one, which is kind of funny. So before I can do anything with this computer, uh, before I can install this computer inside this computer, I have to disassemble the case. Okay, so now we're back inside the case and this is the connector I uh, put on a, a connector here to go with this and I've made it so to make sure that the ground pin actually is pin one here because when we go to connect this we're going to need to connect ground uh, uh, to pin one. So I made sure this is a keyed connector so it can only go in one way. So when this goes in like so I know that pin one is ground. Um, 
So I made a, I went ahead and copied this off the GitHub page. It shows you how to connect the color computer. We're going to connect it directly to the 6847 uh, chip, which I think is this one down here. Uh, up here, 6847. Um, so this is the one that's generating the color and the luminance for the display output. And as you recall, um, uh, uh, I did some testing on, on these chips here uh, last time in the, in the modulator. We're going to be bypassing the modulator altogether, pulling those signals that we need directly from this chip. And then I just need to find a hole somewhere where I can get an HDMI cable out of here once I get everything connected. So I'll go ahead and solder up the wires to the right pins. I'm just going to go ahead and attach them in this case to the top of the pins here. I could put an adapter or something in. I may do that. I don't know. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and solder these directly to the top of the uh, uh, of the actual pins on the chip. Um, that way I can still pull the chip out if I need to. I can clean them up if I need to later. It's not a big deal. So I'll go ahead and do that now. Well, there we go. All the wires are soldered on and I've looked them over. They look like they're okay. But I was very careful only to put a tiny bit of solder on each of these pins so that it didn't go down and, and permanently uh, uh, get in the actual um, pin slots or the sockets um, because I want to be able to get this chip out later. So that's something I wanted to point out is I just used a very little bit of solder on the very top of those pins just to make sure I didn't permanently aff affix this chip to the socket. Um, but I think this is now ready. Um, so I am going to hook the um, this up to my capture card and I'll turn this on and uh, we'll see if it actually works. This thing looks a little bit like a spider or a octopus or something. It looks like something crawled up in here and died, which you uh, find all the time in these old systems. You find bugs and things. It looks like I just added one myself. Now, I won't be actually powering the Pi because I'm pulling five volts from the motherboard, from the color computer itself. So I won't be adding any power to this. When I turn on the color computer, this should just power up. So I'm just gonna get everything connected. Okay, can you imagine if this actually worked? <laughs> can you imagine playing Dungeons of Daggereth uh, on a big screen TV somewhere, or projecting it on the side of a building? That would be pretty cool. Now I'm just double checking everything. Everything looks good. I don't this, expect this to work the uh, right away <clears throat> because I'm going to have to set up the on-screen menu to work with this computer. Like I said, you have to set it so that it knows how to adjust those voltages and everything uh, so that it knows how to interpret the signals correctly. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it on, see if we get power on the Pi. And, yep, I'm getting something. There is a signal. There's no sync detected, uh, but that's very promising. The colors are wrong, and that's to be expected. Let's go ahead and go through the menu here and change the profile. This is really promising. And we're looking for, I assume this is under Tandy. Okay, I think I may have found the issue here. Uh, when I was going through the menus to try to find the correct profile to run, uh, I wasn't, I didn't see any um, profile for the Tandy color computer. And what I realized was, is that the interface was set to 8-bit analog RGB <clears throat> which I think it needs to be 8-bit analog YUV, not RGB. So I think that the wrong firmware might be on here. Uh, there's different choices of firmware, so I think I need to load a different firmware. Luckily, you can do that right from the board because the files are all on that SD card. So what I can do is I can go up to Update CPLD menu, and when I go there, you can see there's three different versions of firmware um, that are loaded here. There's the B, there's the uh, BBC, there's the RGB, and there's the YUV. So I'm going to load the YUV and see if that makes a difference. Uh, asking me to confirm. Yes. Programming the CPLD. 
successful. Now it's going to reboot and hopefully we'll be able to select the Tandy color computer from the, uh, the menu here. Okay, interesting. Let's go ahead and open up the menu. Yeah, now this says 8-bit analog YUV. So let's see if we can change this to Tandy 1000 now. Apple II, ColecoVision, Commodore 64. By the way, you can run this with Commodore 64, but you do need, okay, now we're getting closer. You do need um, a special daughter board, another daughter board, <laughs> a fourth daughter board, a third daughter board for that. TRS-80, modified. It just says, oh, that's the original TRS-80, not the color computer. Oh, here we go. Hey, look at that. Color computer one and two. The menu looks a little bit messed up, but it's actually looking really good. Okay, let's see what's going on here. What if I just do a reset? Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. look at that. This is the Tandy color computer model one connected to HDMI. Uh, let's just type on this thing. Oh, the response time is fantastic. I gotta remember where my where the keys are on this thing. They're a little different. Man, this keyboard still works great after I cleaned it up. That's good. That's good to know. Woo! <laughs> That's awesome. So I finally did it. This is part two, officially part two of the uh, Tandy uh, Coco One repair video that I did before. And now I finally got a great solution. Uh, I think there's only one thing left to do now that I have this working. And that is take it out to the big screen, or not really a big screen, it's like a 46 inch flat screen in, in my living room and load up Dungeons of Dagrath or Starblaze, maybe both. Okay, so in my haste and excitement, I almost forgot uh, I need to hook up some sound because there's no sound uh, that you can pipe through this adapter to get sound to the HDMI. It's just a limitation of the, the, the way that HDMI works. Basically, it's very difficult um, since we're not running a full Raspberry Pi operating system, a full Linux operating system. It's very difficult to get pipe that sound through to, digitally to the digital HDMI signal. So as it stands right now, and that may be a future enhancement, there's no way to actually get sound and pipe that in and have it come out through the HDMI. But I do want sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up a um, an, uh, this little RCA jack to the sound that's coming out of the system. And then I'll be able to connect this to my receiver, or you could connect it to uh, any other, you know, an external uh, amplified speaker, for example, one of those little $20 cheapies, anything like that will do. Uh, or you could plug it right into your TV like I'm going to do, right into your TV, or in this case, right into my amplifier. Uh, but it, I need to figure out where the sound is coming from. And I remember from the last video that one of these pins here had sound on it. So I'm going to try to... Um, I took a uh, eighth inch audio jack and connected it up to my uh, headphones. I apologize if I'm talking too loud right now because I've got my headphones on and I've got, uh, I'm going to connect the ground um, connection on this jack to ground. And then I'm going to use, this should be left and right, the other two poles there. So I'm going to use that and see if I can figure out which one of these is uh, the audio signal. And then I can tap into that to uh, connect to this uh, to, uh, uh, RCA jack to get audio out. So first, let me turn this back on. Okay, perfect. Got the home screen. And then I can type in a small program to generate some sound. So sound 128 comma whatever, 10. I think that's right. Let's run it and see. Oh, I'm not going to be able to hear the sound. <laughs> well, it did something. Okay, 20, go to 10. Now this will run indefinitely. And I should be generating some sound now. And if I connect this to, is it this one? I'm hearing something. Oh, there it is. Just make sure. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so that's the pin that I need to pull the sound from because I can hear it very clearly in my headphones. So I'll wire up to, to that pin right there. 
and uh, should be good to go. I'm glad I remembered the basic command for that because there was no way to tell <laughs> unless I hooked up the regular output to uh, um, a TV or something. There was no way to tell if I was actually getting that right, but I did. So cool. I'll hook up that wire and then we'll go out and test it out on the big screen. Okay, so I'm now in the living room, um, and the reason I have the camera pointed off to the side here is because um, as soon as I turn this onto the TV, because it's an LED TV, it's going to make everything else around the TV look dark. So I just wanted to let you know um, I need to focus in pretty tightly just to get this uh, looking correctly. So let's go ahead and shift over to the TV. So this is actually, I have this connected to the RF out of the color computer into my antenna input on the TV. So this is what happens when you connect uh, a, si a signal like this that is meant to be originally connected to probably a nine inch TV or something like that to a widescreen. In this case, I think it's a 46 ish inch flat panel TV. Everything gets a little fuzzy. Everything gets a little wonky. It doesn't look very good. However, uh, I can go ahead and change this or switch this over. I also have the HDMI connected to the new solution that I just hooked up. So let's take a look at what that looks like. There we go. Look at that. Okay, hopefully there's no more effect on the uh, on the screen now, but look at that. This thing is super bright and super sharp. Uh, one of the problems I had when I was trying to get composite output uh, to uh, flat panel TV is that things just weren't clear and things were kind of dark. I could never get a nice bright picture. But this picture is actually even brighter, I think, than the uh, than the TV picture, or at least as bright. It looks really good. There's the TV picture, again, for comparison. And there's the HDMI uh, output. So this is looking really, really good. And I did uh, go ahead and type in a quick program so we could test the sound and make sure that's working. And yep, it is working. Just a simple loop that goes up from 1 to 25 of the various sounds that the computer can produce. But we don't need to listen to all of that. So there we go. This is definitely a success. Everything is, is crystal clear, running in 1080p, uh, 1920 by 1080. Uh, it looks really, really good. And so I think this is the final solution that I'm going to go with, at least for this computer. But let's take a look and see how it looks with a few games. Let's start out with uh, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite games of all time, Dungeons of Daggereth. And because we are using the power uh, coming from the color computer, or from the uh, color computer to power the Pi, every time you turn it on, it's going to go into that uh, uh, rainbow pattern. And I'm also noticing some artifacts on the screen as well. I don't know if you can see those off to the side. We might need to do a calibration. If you remember on the last video, in order to get the the uh, sampling right, I had to do an auto calibrate. So let me see if I can do that now, and we'll see if we can sharpen this up and get rid of those little squiggles. Go down to auto calibrate, and let's see what it does. You're supposed to do this with a still screen, but hopefully this will work, even though there's a little bit of stuff going on here. Yeah, that still doesn't look good. So let's go ahead and change the sampling manually and see what we can do. Go into sampling menu. Sampling phase. Okay, that's looking better. This is on two. Yeah, when we get into five, it gets that we get that little thing going on the side there. Let's move it back to two. That seemed pretty good. There we go. Now it's looking really good. Let's see if I can play this this keyboard on this original color computer is awful to play this game on, but let's just see if I can play a little bit here. There's abbreviations. If you've never played this, there's abbreviations for all the commands. Wow, it looks so good. Pull the left torch. As you can see the abbreviations there. And that delay, the slight delay on the commands is actually the way the game normally works. Pull, right, sword. So when you first start playing this game, you type all those things out verbatim. Pull, you know, P-U-L-L, -L, all that stuff. Very quickly you learn that you, uh, you you don't have time to do that in this game. So you you learn the abbreviations for everything. 
But now I think I can turn around and find some monsters. Oops. Yeah, that's what happens when you run into a wall. There's a secret up here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, that's a blob. That's not good. Is this it? Nope. There is a secret door here somewhere, I swear. Oh, this is going to be bad. This guy will kill me right away. Oh, I got him. Get left torch. Reveal left. Stow left. Okay. Well, that was pretty easy. Oh, there's a blob. There's no way I'm surviving a blob. Where is it? Oh, there it is. This blob's going to kill me for sure. In this game, there's different levels of torches, and with this first level of pine torch, you can't see very far. That's why things are fuzzy. <laughs> I'm going to die. Yep, I'm dead. Just like that. And we get the, the kill message. The, after you died, you get this message. Yet another does not return. Uh, it's such a great game. Okay, let's try a different game. I'm curious to see if any of those video artifacts show up. Nope. Now, you did see it uh, because I just turned it on. You can see the screen dims a little bit, and it gives you the resolution up top. There might be a way to take that out. Uh, of the program. Of course, if you if you plug this into an external power source instead of the internal power source, then once it powered up and it was on, you wouldn't have to worry about that. You could reset your system as much as you want. But since we're using the actual color computer to power it, we get those startup messages every time. Uh, okay, so this is a Starblaze cartridge, and I've got a... Uh, you can't see it here, but I've got a deluxe joystick, Tandy deluxe joystick, and... Uh, Let's select a skill level, maybe skill one. Oh, there's aliens. And here we go. One thing that's always neat about this game is as you go below the horizon there, the ship changes color so you can see it better. I always thought that was a nice touch. Oh, Ooh, he hit me a little bit. Let's see. Go back. This is looking so good. I hit that. I have no more shields. My shields are gone. Ah. So anyway, this is a Defender clone. A bad move. Yeah, thanks. This is a Defender clone, and um, it's pretty fun. The colors aren't as good, uh, of course, but uh, there we go. Uh, but it's a pretty good, pretty good reproduction, and um, it's a lot of fun to play, especially on this huge screen. That's crazy. Oh, that took away a little bit of my shields. Anyway, a lot of fun to play. I think I'm going to leave this on and uh, play a little bit more, but I think I'm going to call this a success for sure. Uh, I did not expect this to come out quite this well. I was hoping it would, but it was actually really easy to set up, and I could actually uh, leave this in the case. I could embed it into the case. In fact, I think it would fit nicely right on top of the existing um, uh, RF modulator. I could stick it right there and cut a little hole in the case, and then I could leave it in there and just just have it in, just connect this thing to HDMI whenever I wanted to, which would be really cool. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to going to uh, take this back out so I can test it on some other systems, maybe an Apple II or um, some other system like that. But for now, I'm really happy that I was able to get this ooh, get this connected and get it working because it's working really really well. Um, that's it for this episode, folks. If you like this part three of the HDMI, uh, it's R started out as RGB to HDMI. I don't know. This is uh, YUV to RGB to HDMI, but uh, part three, if you liked it, hit the like button. And of course, please subscribe. So you'll, uh, my videos will show up in your feed as you're looking for something to watch. I try to release every week or so. Um, 
occasionally work gets in the way because this is not my full-time job, but uh, uh, I try to release about every week. And if you like the videos, hit the subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. I'm, I just noticed the other day that I'm actually up to about 500 subscribers, which is crazy. Um, so thank you if you're a subscriber. I really appreciate it. Um, you could also, it's hard to talk and play at the same time. You could also sign up to my Patreon page if you want to support me monetarily. I know a few of you have already, so I really appreciate it. You can vote on um, upcoming episodes, and uh, eventually I'm going to start doing some behind-the-scenes type stuff. So go ahead and go to my Patreon page. It's just patreon.retrohackshack, and you can contribute 2 bucks a month at the lowest level. For $10 a month, you get your name in the credits. So uh, take advantage of that, too. Not only your name, but your picture. I think for $5, you get your name in the credits. For $10, you get to put a picture in the credits. And uh, so there's some fun benefits there for supporting the channel as well. But that's it for this time. Thanks for watching, guys. Really appreciate it. I'm going to keep playing this game. Uh, we'll see you next time. Oh. Oh, 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 I'm out of shields. I'm out of bullets? What? I'm out of bullets. How do I get more bullets? I'm out of torpedoes. Bad move. There was nothing I could do. Uh, I don't remember how to get more, more torpedoes. I'll have to figure that out. <laughs>